gambling that people were allowed to do themselves. Um, so he trained this model based on a whole lot of peripheral information about weather and how many of the good uh, best players were, were out and all sorts of stuff. And he created a predictive model to guess who was going to win each game. And he actually entered this model in a footy tipping competition and won it like very, very handily. He didn't, it wasn't even close. He destroyed the rest of the field. So I was doing the same degree. I was doing a fourth year thesis and I was actually running a footy tipping competition at the same time. And I thought to myself, well, hang on, here's an actual use for machine learning. Maybe I can finish this degree, you know, talk to this guy and work out how he did it and then just live off the proceeds of gambling and never actually have to work. So I, I asked him, you know, what, how complicated is this? How difficult is it to do? And he said, Oh, Damien, it's really easy. All you need to do is build a deep neural network. Um, so you'll need a lot of layers and a lot of nodes. Um, so a deep neural network. And uh, also you'll probably need to know a little bit of maths. So, um, for example, you'll need some training algorithms. You'll uh, need some, um, you know, maybe look at using stochastic gradient descent for your tuning and all that. Like he basically went on and asked how, how, uh, how good my multidimensional calculus was. And like, spoiler, it's not great. Um, I'm pretty much restricted to one dimension in most aspects of my life. Um, so my multidimensional calculus was not good, but it was at this point that I realized that the state of machine learning at the time was not really accessible to me. I'm not this person. So um, I did the obvious thing and um, what any good computer science student would do. And I completely dropped the idea and I um, finished uni and went and worked for the government writing VB, um, which is a true story. Uh, Queensland police, VB.net. So the, the message there at the time was that, yeah, it was cool. It might be able to do some useful things, but it's not really accessible. You fast forward a few years and that's certainly not the case anymore. Like it's, it's much more accessible now than it ever used to be. So um, there's a few different levels of using machine learning. It's very easy to actually use that in your own applications. Now um, I pretty much classify them from easy through medium and hard, depending on how much customization you want to do with your model. So your easy stuff, um, you can use, for example, cognitive services or the ones from any other cloud provider. And they're pretty much out of the box using an existing model. The captions you're seeing at the bottom of this uh, screen, by the way, are an out of the box um, feature of uh, PowerPoint. So I didn't have to write a model, train a model to learn my voice or anything like that. This is out of the box. So we can just use these existing models, image recognition, text to speech, um, sentiment analysis, all that kind of thing. Uh, we can just use those, those things. But if you want a custom model to your particular domain, then you can go a little bit further and you can customize a pre-trained model. So this is things like um, Azure Custom Vision. So you can use existing pre-trained models, but then customize it by feeding your own images. And what you'll get is a model that knows about your specific domain, but is also using all of the, the many, many hundreds of hours of pre-training that's happened. Um, there's other things like the, the bot engines and the um, uh, sentiment, and, sorry, not sentiment analysis, there's um, forms recognizer, there's a whole bunch of these things that you can use. Basically, it's using existing trained models, but then tuning them to yours using usually techniques like transfer learning and stuff like that. And then of course, there's the hard stuff, which is training a new model from scratch. Here's a pile of data, give me some kind of prediction I'll train a model to give me some kind of prediction at the other end. So what we're kind of focusing on a little bit more here is the, the stuff towards the right of this graph. If you're using out of the box stuff, having a DevOps pipeline to enable that um, is not, not terribly necessary. You're kind of just calling an API, right? The rest of your application, absolutely. Yeah, it should be using a great DevOps process to enable, you know, versioning of which APIs you're calling, but you're not doing that work yourself. The pre-trained models, there are, sorry, customized pre-trained models. Yes, you can definitely apply some of these techniques and, and we'll talk about that kind of right at the end, but really we're talking about training a new model from scratch. And you may not do that yourself, but you may have a data science team in your organization that does that kind of work. So um, the process for doing that though, is in computer science, uh, sorry, in, in data science and in machine learning terms, it's fairly 
um, immature, let's say. So if we look at what's actually involved in training one of these models, and I don't want to go too much into the weeds of how machine learning works, more how the process and ML ops works around it. So in general, you'll do something like you'll prepare your data, gather your data um, from uh, various sources, uh, you know, filter it to make sure that the, the bad rows aren't there and aren't, aren't causing issues. Um, you can, uh, you know, normalize it. You can strip out stuff. You can combine data from different data sources, all that kind of stuff. You'll use an algorithm to, uh, to or build an algorithm to train your predictive model. And at the end, you'll get this predictive model and you can evaluate that um, based on how well it succeeds from uh, using test data and things like that. At the end of this, and you know, then obviously rinse and repeat, you might go back to try and find or gather more data, filter the data a different way. You might try a different algorithm. You know, there's a lot of experimentation that goes on in this. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but in, in our traditional software development, when you get a problem, usually you know roughly how that problem is going to be solved. So you'll know, for example, if somebody says, hey, I want you to um, uh, work out what the repayments are on this loan that we're going to give someone. You kind of have in your head how you're going to do that work. With machine learning, it might be something like, um, give me the probability that this person, given their financial history, is going to default on a loan of X dollars. Now, the logic behind that's a little bit more difficult. It's a bit trickier to come up with. So machine learning is good for those kinds of problems. Um, ultimately though, uh, after a whole bunch of experimentation, you should hopefully have a model that does a good job of that prediction, but it might take a hundred dead ends. It might take months before you have something that's actually giving you a good result. Um, when you do though, putting it into production, much like, um, traditional software development used to have problems, um, machine learning definitely still has a lot of problems with that. So you get this model produced by data scientists and then they kind of do what we used to do in software development and we kind of throw it over the wall to programmers somewhere in production right um, it's a case of like uh, how do we actually get it there not sure here's a file do something with it um, what actually happens day to day is quite often the work of doing the training happens on a uh, a desktop that a computer scientist has, or sorry, a data scientist has, or a machine learning expert has. The deployment might be, here's a USB stick with the latest um, like pickle file or um, the latest bit of, uh, bed, latest model basically, can you somehow put this in your application? Or even in a lot of cases, sending it via email until it gets too big and then maybe we'll put it on a file share somewhere. But the process of doing that um, is not very mature. Um, we've all probably heard about traditional software development, how something like, I don't know the exact stat, but something like 80% yeah, of programming projects uh, go over time or over budget. It might even be higher. In machine learning terms, there was a McKinsey report a while ago that showed that, um, in 2017, I think, that showed that 88% of machine learning projects never make it to production. So that gives you an idea of kind of the state of, of machine learning at the moment. Um, in terms of process. So MLOps is supposed to fix this kind of stuff. So if we move on and think about DevOps itself and how we do this in, in DevOps, we have these kind of cycle of planning our work, writing the code, testing it, releasing it to environments, pushing it out to production, and then looking at it and monitoring what people are doing, learning from that, and that feeding back into your um, development process. And if you can run through this cycle quickly and effectively, um, without you know deploying bad stuff out to production, this is kind of the key to DevOps: doing this stuff as fast as you can, continuously iterating. So, the definition of DevOps that Microsoft uses uh, is that it's a union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. So, the idea behind ML Ops is applying these practices and these principles, and this principle specifically, to machine learning projects. Now you'll notice that I, uh, I highlighted one of the words there, which is that it's about continuous delivery of value. So it's not continuous delivery of code or continuous delivery of infrastructure or whatever it is. It's continuous delivery of value. 
So if you have an element of machine learning, a predictive model in your application, and you have improved the accuracy of that model, and you want to push that out to production, that is delivering value to your end users. So there's no change that we need to make to the definition of DevOps to be able to apply it to machine learning projects. It's just a different form of value. And I think that's really important because uh, quite often you look at DevOps and say, well, that's for developers or operations people, like the devs and the ops people get in a room and they do their work together. Um, data science, machine learning, well, that's a whole different area. They don't, they don't really contribute to the DevOps area. But if they're delivering value, then they absolutely should be a part of, part of what DevOps delivers. So um, let's talk about some of the tooling that can help with this. And by the way, on the way through, while, while I'm talking about this, feel free to, to throw stuff in the chat as well. Um, I, I'm watching it kind of in the corner of the screen. So if you have any questions on the way through, let me know and I will, uh, I'll get to them quickly. All right, so let's talk about Azure Machine Learning. This is one of the products that you can use. Um, I work for Microsoft. I, it would be remiss of me to not mention some of these things. Um, so Azure Machine Learning is essentially just a collection of different tools, essentially, that enable machine learning project um, management, I guess. So it's a little bit like your DevOps tooling that you might use for your projects. So um, GitHub, obviously, um, using uh, issues and um, source control and um, actions and all that kind of stuff to manage your projects. But this is focused around machine learning specifically. Um, so it has a bunch of these features. Um, there's notebooks, so Jupyter Notebooks, which I'll talk about really briefly um, soon. Uh, automated ML designers and things like that. But I wanna talk about specifically these, these things here. The, um, the assets, sorry, the, um, the data sets, experiments, pipelines, models, endpoints, the data compute, sorry, and uh, compute and data stores and data labeling and things. These are all concepts that would apply to machine learning projects. Data sets are these registered known data sets. You don't want a copy of the you know, 30 terabyte database on every developer's machine or every data scientist's machine. Um, similarly, experiments, you want to be able to track them. You want pipelines to be able to automatically run experiments when new data comes in or when they're triggered based on a change to your algorithm. Um, you want to be able to version the predictive models themselves so you know what you've deployed when. Sorry, I am just realized I'm going to not do that. Um, the endpoints one actually gives you a couple of, uh, a couple of points. There's a real-time endpoint, so when you deploy a model, um, that's just uh, exposing that model via a a um, web service or pipeline endpoints. So endpoints where you can trigger a new pipeline, a new training workflow, for example. And when you're using all these things, um, you would use managed compute. So not everybody has you know, a, a machine with a ton of GPUs or you know, terabytes of RAM, but the cloud does. So you can start using those machines um, instead, scale them up and scale them down as required. Um, the data stores give you connections to data that's stored in Azure, whether that's blob storage or SQL databases or wherever that data is. Um, and then you can also do things like scalable labeling. So labeling a whole lot of images at once um, for image recognition and detection and, and things like that. So these are all concepts of things that you might use in your machine learning project. I like to kind of focus on the uh, pipelines part Sorry, it's just giving me all the animations again. So the pipelines, which is the actual training workflows. When you're doing that though, you're pretty much using all of these aspects. So you are connecting to data sets to, to run your experiments. At the end of this pipeline, you're gonna end up with a model that you wanna register as a version of that model. Um, when you're doing it, you're, doing, you're using compute, for example. Um, you're maybe connecting to data stores that exist somewhere else. You might be, if you're doing image recognition, you might be labeling that data too. So focusing on pipelines is, is just one way of doing it. Um, so you might be asking as well, uh, Azure Machine Learning, and there's pipelines in here as well. Uh, what about, you know, if we're just using pipelines here, how does this tie into GitHub and the other DevOps tools that we have? Now. I usually do this talk and talk about um, Azure DevOps. Obviously that, that 
focus has shifted a little bit, as some of you may have noticed. Um, Azure ML pipelines, machine learning pipelines, is a different product to Azure pipelines. Azure pipelines is part of Azure DevOps, and it focuses on different things, which I'll talk about in a minute. GitHub Actions, again, focuses on different things. It's not targeted around machine learning. And there's a few differences. I would recommend using both where they make sense. So integrating between these two things, um, there are a lot of options available. So uh, there's a whole bunch of actions. I think there's five actions that Microsoft wrote for um, adding to your workflow to communicate with Azure ML pipelines or Azure ML in general. Um, if you're using the uh, command line, there's an AZ extension as a, as a CLI ML. If you're using Python for any of your, any of your scripts, um, there's an Azure ML SDK um, Python library as well. So a lot of different ways you can communicate with ML pipelines to integrate between these two tools. The, um, the pipeline, sorry, the uh, GitHub pipelines uh, actions, sorry, GitHub pipeline, GitHub actions uh, that have been made available for Azure Machine Learning, there's five of them here. And so you can see you know, what, they, what they do basically. Um, run experiments, um, register a model, you know, all of this kind of stuff that you wanna, that you wanna do on your, during your pipeline. Right, so you can do this integration. Um, the question though, of course, when would you use each? Um, do you have to use both? Can't you just do everything through GitHub Actions? Um, there's a few reasons that I would recommend using, using them individually and separately. If we look at Azure Machine Learning Pipelines to start off with, what these are really is a, a workflow that gives you steps that allow you to use data sources and data sets. So these connections to large amounts of data, which is really important with training, and compute targets to actually do the processing so we don't all have to have a development machine with five GPUs in it. Right? So it's built around the idea of machine learning projects. One big difference between traditional software projects and machine learning projects um, is the size of the, um, or sorry, the, the size of the build essentially, the length of the time it takes to create an artifact. So with a traditional software development project, a slow build might take an hour or two. Like that would be a large build. Um, with machine learning, you might be talking about a month of training or, you know, several days of training using a huge amount of data. So you wanna be able to run this training run and then come back when it's finished. So these unattended runs is part of it, uh, part of one of the features. Similarly, there might be a number of steps in your pipeline. So maybe a bunch of steps to filter that data that you're getting. And that might take quite a while, but it's something you don't need to do every single time you do a, you do a training run. Maybe you wanna reuse that the results of that step in subsequent runs. So you can do that very easily as well, reuse the results of previous steps in future runs. But mainly it's about tracking and versioning all of these ML concepts. So the experiments themselves, the um, produced models, the versions of the models that you get, um, and tracking them in a way that makes sense for data science projects. If you compare that to GitHub Actions, for example, this is GitHub Actions is really about orchestration and automation for CI CD. And obviously, CI CD is not the only thing that you can use Actions for, but um, we talk about it a lot as a CI CD tool these days. It lets you create workflows and processes to enable quality of your code and things like that. Um, it allows you to integrate with other services as well. So if you're doing machine learning and producing a model, but then you want to deploy that model to somewhere else, then you might want to do that with GitHub Actions. Or if you wanted to pull data from a bunch of places or get a version of your code or um, pull in libraries and pre-compile them and things like that, the integration with other services is important too. And importantly, you want to be able to trigger these events on code events and non-code events. So there are ways of uh, triggering a workflow in GitHub Actions from other places. So um, I think it's dispatch events or something like that you can do. Maybe if somebody leaves an issue saying, hey, this um, data set that you've got here um, you know, is invalid, you might want to have an action that automatically pauses that training run, for example, if it's been running for a while. So you can, you can trigger these events, uh, trigger these workflows on non-code events too. 
What you might end up with though is a, a process in GitHub Actions which creates this pipeline in Azure Machine Learning. And in that pipeline, the thing that runs in um, AML pipelines, you might have some data preparation like we talked about before, the training step. And at the end, you'll create a model that you then register as this is version 1.2 of our model. Right. Along the way, you might use you know, known data sets and Azure Compute to do that work. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about the collaboration aspect of this too, because that's a big part of DevOps. Um, this is one of the tools, this is the designer, which is a, a preview um, in Azure Machine Learning. This is something I, I put together in a couple of minutes. It's basically just to produce a predictive model to um, make predictions on how much a car would cost based on, I think the columns that I cared about were things like the engine size, number of doors, type of car and then the make um, of the car. And it, it actually, like I just dragged and dropped these things around on a canvas and it actually did a reasonable job. Like that's the scored labels at the end. And you can see like there's some inaccuracies in the actual numbers, but you can see the graph is kind of along the right lines of what it is. So this took a few minutes. It was me dragging things around, making changes to those settings. And that's great. That's wonderful. I can use the tooling to create a predictive model really easily, but what, are, what does the rest of my team do? How do we collaborate on creating this, this um, pipeline to create the predictive model? Like how do we, um, how do we version this, uh, this experiment that I've created? How do we version the models that it's produced? Um, that stuff is really hard. So we can go back in this case to some good DevOps practices. So these ones are the kind of your core ones that people talk about with DevOps. There's the idea of source control so that everybody's working off the same code, your code gets merged, um, and that allows you to do things like continuous integration and continuous delivery. So every time somebody makes a commit, um, you know, it'll merge with everybody else's and make sure that that all, that all compiles correctly and things like that. So let's talk about source control to start off with. And source control is often an unfamiliar concept to data scientists. Data scientists are not programmers. So um, teaching them to use Git might be something that's important, but it's certainly not you know, a thing that they would use day to day traditionally. So source control uh, for machine learning, there are a few things that are really important. Ideally, you should have everything in source control um, that relates to the code that you're going to run and the comments around it. So I mentioned Jupyter Notebooks really briefly. Some of you may be familiar, but Jupyter Notebooks is a, is a great tool for data science, for machine learning. Um, and it basically allows you to create these cells of work. So um, maybe there's a cell that says, go and get the data from here. Now another cell that says, now visualize it for me so I can see what it looks like. Okay, we'll create another cell to strip out the ones that are clearly broken. Uh, create another cell to do these things. And that's actually code. It's, it's um, whatever language you want and actually supports quite a few languages. And then the output when you run those cells appears afterwards. Now one of the good and bad things about these Jupyter notebook files is that it stores not just the code that gets run and the comments that you make and things, but it also stores the output of that run. And it's good in that if you have a notebook that has a whole lot of information and maybe one of those tasks, which is you know, to go and get a whole lot of data and summarize it, maybe that takes quite a while. So you can share a notebook file with somebody that has the output there already. So they don't have to run it themselves. And that's great. But if you're checking in that file or committing that file to a Git repository and it has your output in it, that causes a lot of problems for merging, um, for rerunning those, those um, things again, uh, those cells again. It can be a bit tricky. There are ways that you can um, tie into uh, git commit um, hooks to strip the output before you push it out, even dump it to HTML um, so that you have that as a record, but then just commit the code. Ultimately though, the stuff you wanna track and the stuff you want in your pipeline is the code only, the code and the comments only. Um, ideally, it shouldn't even really be in Jupyter. Jupyter is a bit more for experimentation, but um, so if you have these things in separate Python files, for example, uh, that would be even better. But you know, at a at a stretch, um, 
you know, you can put the Jupyter files in there as well. And that means that it's quite nice for the data scientists to use when they're doing their day-to-day -day work. You also want every part of the pipeline, just the same way as we want to define our builds, our, you know, our continuous integration builds and our releases in YAML or in whatever language you want to do, uh, you want to use. We want to define that and have that in source control for our machine learning projects as well. Um, infrastructure and dependencies, any Python libraries, Python versions, other um, dependencies that you need, so connections to data sources and things like that, that should also be in your code. Um, the one thing though that shouldn't probably be in code is your data and in source control is your data. If you're training off a 30 terabyte database, you don't want that in Git, trust me. However, you might want to maybe put a subset of data if you really want, just so somebody can locally say, oh, let's just run this training over a very small set of data just to see if it makes sense. Um, if you do that, it's, it's very useful to have a subset of data that is representative, hard problem to have, um, but it means that you don't have, to autom don't have to do a full training run every time. You can actually work locally. So those things uh, are important for machine learning projects. Um, in source control. The, the key thing, of course, is that everything should be in source control because then it can be tracked, right? Um, including, well, sorry, except your training data. And that should be a known kind of shared data source that everybody has access to. Um, you don't want people running their training runs over completely different data sets and coming up with models that are based on you know, different input data. That leads to very inconsistent results and it leads to not being able to trace what what happened and where these where these models came from once everything is in source control of, of course the next step would be continuous integration um, and this is where you could use github actions or something like that um, when you change the algorithms that you're using for training then you can make you can trigger that continuous integration um, when you do that the, the actual continuous integration should ideally refresh and execute a machine learning pipeline. And by the way, I'm talking about Azure Machine Learning as the tool to use for machine learning pipelines. There are also a few others. So Kubeflow is a very popular one um, based on Kubernetes. So you can uh, define containers that will do the training for you and um, Kubeflow will, will organize and, and orchestrate those. Uh, there was a really good one that's very data focused uh, called Pachyderm that I learned about the other day. It allows you to version your data really nicely, um, which can be really, really hard to do. Uh, so there are other tools you can use, but ultimately your CI in GitHub Actions or Azure Pipelines or Jenkins or whatever you're using should um, ideally, you know, allow you to refresh that pipeline and re-execute it. So make a change to the pipeline and then re-execute it. Um, but also the code that you use to train your models is code, right? In, in the case of all the ones that I've done before, it's Python, but it could be R, it could be, it could be a number of things. That code still needs to maintain quality. Like you want code quality in what's there. You can run unit tests over the parts of the code um, that are important to run unit tests over. Linting, all that kind of stuff is just part of what these CI tools are good for. And as well as that, the standard pull request processes that you might use for your traditional projects, they can also be important. Maybe um, on a pull request, which is a change to your uh, training algorithm, maybe you wanna do a pull request um, continuous integration uh, workflow that does a really short, small training run over a small set of data just to prove it out. You don't wanna run your week's worth of training on every pull request um, or make somebody merge it into master before you know it works. Maybe your pull request process can run a really short, quick, cheap training run just to make, just to do a little bit of a smoke test. So those processes can exist as well. Ultimately, this is because the code quality matters. What you're doing is you're using code and data to create a predictive model and artifacts just like you would do your build. And so the code quality matters even in data science, even if this is something that is uh, not traditionally done or thought of as software development. So now we have a model, let's say, at the end of our pipeline, what do we do with that model? The deployment part is, is kind of one of these challenges that we were talking about. So what I could do is I could just add another step to my 
Azure Machine Learning Pipeline so that when the model gets created, I could just deploy it then. And there are native things inside Azure Machine Learning to automatically do that. When you create a model or when you register a model, just deploy it. So I could throw it there and let Azure Machine Learning do that work for me. I would generally recommend not doing that. The reason is that we want to control what's happening, um, what's being deployed out to production, just the same as we would with any project. So when a model is registered, we get this new model, we want to run some tests. So we want to deploy that model to a test or a staging environment, somewhere that's not production, that'll allow us to make sure that it is actually providing the value we expect. We might want to run integration tests to make sure it actually still works with the code that's supposed to be calling it, supposed to be using it. We might want to run load tests because the performance of the model is important. If you have a, an amazingly accurate image recognition um, predictive model, but it takes a minute to run every time you send it an image, that's probably less valuable than one that's not quite as accurate, but runs in seconds. So your load testing might be really important there. Ultimately, the continuous delivery stuff is all about control. You want to be able to control the rollout of this model rather than just throwing one in production. You want to maybe be able to control its rollout using feature flags, maybe do some A-B testing. And this can be really, really important with things like recommendations engines. It's kind of hard based on your training data to work out whether the model you've just produced is going to perform better than the model that's currently in production. The only real way to test whether it is performing better is to put it in production and compare it against the one that's there. So controlling that rollout is really important. And these are all techniques that we tend to use with our um, standard, you know, traditional software development projects. Now, I've got the logo there for GitHub Actions, and you can do this stuff with Actions. Um, the, it's not quite as nice as it could be um, doing this idea of deploying to staging and test and promotion. You do have to do a bit of work at the moment. This is obviously being worked on, um, but if you're using Azure Pipelines, a lot of this stuff is kind of out of the box. Not out of the box, but it's, it's designed around this fully featured kind of release engine as well. So you could use uh, Azure Pipelines instead of GitHub Actions if you wanted to. The important part of the continuous delivery part is that you want to control your model rollout roll exactly the same way as you do with the rest of your software. So what would an end-to-end -end pipeline look like? We've got our data prep training and model registration that we talked about, and that would exist in our Azure Machine Learning Pipeline or Kubeflow Pipeline or Pachyderm or whatever other tool you want to use. Something designed around doing that training, those long-running training sessions, uh, with a lot of data, um, but ultimately that, that exists in that machine learning tool. When that model gets registered, maybe you want to use, and I've got Azure DevOps here, um, a release pipeline that will deploy to an Azure container instance or something for testing. Maybe you want to evaluate how well that works with a real application, maybe send some traffic to that instance, and then depending on whether it works correctly or as expected or better than what's in production, deploy it to maybe an AKS cluster, Azure, Azure Kubernetes instance a service cluster. So actually roll it out to production. So that might exist in a separate pipeline as well. What about the start of it? So if you, you actually want to um, do some more training or retrain based on some code changes, maybe you've changed the algorithm. So um, you could do this retraining periodically um, or when you hit some threshold. And this is an important concept in machine learning as well. Generally with software, when you deploy a working solution, that working solution will remain current and will remain working for a period of time. With machine learning projects and predictive um, models, that's not always the case. Um, sometimes uh, you need to uh, retrain them because the data that it's used for that model is now stale. And this is particularly true with, for example, recommendations engines where you might add new products to your product library. You want to start suggesting those products. So you've got to retrain your model so it's aware of what those products are. Or maybe just the environment changes, the, the world changes and people care about things that are different than what they cared about a week ago. So you can either do this periodically or you could do it um, 
yeah, or you could do it based on some kind of accuracy threshold. Maybe people aren't clicking on the, uh, the links as often as they were, so you want to run a, a retraining run. Or maybe you've got new data, and so you want to run a, a training run. So you'd run through this pipeline, um, get a model at the other end, deploy it to container instances and Kubernetes service, and that would be the, the full deployment, no touch ideally. There's also a, uh, a concept in um, Azure Machine Learning called uh, automatic retraining. And so I mentioned that there are data sets that are known uh, data sets that you can use. So if you had a training data set, you basically register this location, this set of data as your training data set. You would run through that training, get a model out the other end, deploy it to production. And then when it's in production, you would uh, when somebody makes a request or actually uses that uh, model to make a prediction, you would add that prediction to an inference data set or add the, the data they sent to an inference data set. So these two data sets exist, one which is what you trained on and one which is what's actually happening in production, what people are doing in production. And then you can get Azure Machine Learning to periodically compare those two data sets and based on some kind of statistical method decide, well, it's, it's drifted enough that uh, what we're seeing in production is not the same as what we've been training on. So let's do a retraining. So that's hit some threshold. Let's retrain based on a combination of the old data and the new data. And it will even automatically evaluate whether the new model would have performed better than the old model based on the new stuff that's happening in production or even the old stuff that was happening in production too. So you can check that before you roll it out to production as well. So that's kind of cool. Um, and what about if you change the pipeline entirely? So we're not just talking about data or retraining, then that's where you get GitHub Actions or Azure Pipelines or something to see that there's a code change. And based on that, refresh your entire machine learning pipeline and kick it off again to get a new model at the other end. Same deal, once you have that model, evaluate how accurate it is and roll it out to production if that's what you wanna do. Now, I've talked mainly about this third aspect where we're building a model from scratch ourselves. But what about if you, um, sorry, and deploying it to you know, a container in production, but that model might be something that you embed in a mobile app and deploy that out. So then you would use the same kind of deployment techniques as you would currently for those types of traditional software projects. If you're using cognitive services and just the out of the box stuff, there is an API that you can use and those APIs get versioned. So you might wanna make sure that your application uh, cares about the version that you're calling and then um, you, you manage that in your DevOps process as well. So your application is not just calling latest, right? You, you know that what it's calling is going to be more accurate for your, meet, for your needs. If you're doing the customized models as well, Maybe you want to produce a custom model and then evaluate whether that custom model is better than the previous custom model. And you can do that just by hitting the APIs in cognitive services. Um, Azure pipelines, and I should have changed that to, to make that GitHub actions as well, but ultimately it can orchestrate anything. So whatever tools you're using to do your model training, um, you can integrate with these orchestration tools with GitHub actions and with Azure pipelines. So it doesn't really matter how you're doing this stuff. Um, you know, this example was just an example. Uh, you, can, you can absolutely use these DevOps tools to manage that process. So a little summary of just the things that I've, I've mentioned about. I've mentioned uh, all of your code and infrastructure and the um, training uh, pipelines and things like that, all of that should be in source control. The data should be known shared data sources rather than data that's in source control or just local versions that developers are working off. The using Azure Machine Learning Pipelines or Kubeflow or Pachyderm or whatever you want to use, as well as GitHub Actions or Azure Pipelines or Jenkins or um, whatever else you want, is really important because they have different skills, like they have different focuses and different strengths and weaknesses. So use the right tool where it, where it works and integrate um, between them. Um, it's really important to have retraining strategies. Um, when a model is in production, and is proved to be really accurate, it may not stay accurate. The world changes and these predictive models should change with them as well. Um, the delivery part of actually deploying your predictive model, 
you can use pretty much any DevOps good practice that we use for our traditional software projects. Um, there is no real difference between deploying a model and deploying an API, for example. It's just a bit of code that's running somewhere that can be called and gives a result at the other end. So those DevOps good practices um, are good practices for machine learning projects as well as software development projects. All right, so I talked a lot. There's a bunch of resources. There's a version of this talk um, that I did at the Microsoft Ignite, the tour events that ran last year and started to run again this year uh, until some stuff happened and we couldn't really run them anymore. Um, but you can watch that video uh, at that first link. There's some Microsoft Learn um, courses that you can do for free, one which teaches you Azure Machine Learning and one that teaches you DevOps in general. Um, and then there's also the machine learning, Azure Machine Learning documentation that's on, um, on Microsoft Docs as well. So those links uh, could be pretty handy if you wanna actually learn how to use some of these tools um, or you know, watch the video where I, I actually run through some demos of it, um, actually using it to, to solve a real problem. Um, so those links are there. Uh, thanks heaps for listening to me for the past, uh, what are we, 50 minutes? Um, and yeah, I, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm also here, obviously. So feel free to, um, to, to yell out if you have any questions. And uh, thanks again. Thank you very, very much, Damien. Um, very, very interesting indeed. Um, I'll grab those uh, links and uh, um, if possible, the, um, the PowerPoint after this and I'll put it up on our website um, after this. Oh, way ahead of me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, right. You've done this before, haven't you? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. um, I don't have any questions. Does anyone else have any questions? We'll be very quiet. Oh, There's one for you. Cool. So we can version models, but if you can dev test prod models, or should it be dev equals model 1.0 and prod equals model uh, 3.0? So uh, I would treat this very much the same way as you treat the rest of your software. So if let's say you had a version of your application, which is version one, and you deployed that out to test and staging, and then went, ah, actually, this isn't working as well as I'd, I'd want. Um, Let's just leave that in staging. Meanwhile, fix it in version 1.1 and roll that through test staging. Okay, that one's good. So production now contains 1.1. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't retrain ever for deploying to test and then retrain for staging and retrain for production or anything like that. I would, I would train a model and then roll that model through, sorry, wrong way, roll that model through, you know, test, staging production or, or whatever you do like that. So, um, you know, dev should be model 1.0 and then you promote that to test and then promote that to production um, would be the way that I'd treat it. Does that, is that answering the question? Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, have I seen Databricks as the training compute with customers or the built in compute cluster? I don't know a lot about Databricks, but I do know that you can integrate, I think. Um, the person to ask about Databricks would probably be Lena Hall. Um, she's on the advocacy team. So I can find out uh, if you like. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? Let's just do this very quickly. Let's do uh, ml.azure.com and let's jump to mine and just see what I can create. Actually. From memory, all that I can create through this portal is a, uh, a VM. So this is probably not gonna not gonna give you much. I'll have to ask um, I'll have to ask Lena about that using Databricks as the training compute. If you are doing that though, and you are triggering that that compute through um, you know a, a orchestration engine like GitHub Actions or um, Azure Pipelines, then you should be able to integrate directly with Databricks to say hey, here's the new pipeline, I would hope, um, just with the APIs. So I guess that would be the, the training mechanism um, rather than Azure Machine Learning, I think. But again, I'm not big on Databricks. Um, Joel had a question, Do the inference data set, does the inference data set contain the labels that came out of the model? 
If so, would that cause a re, uh, feedback loop when used for retraining? Yes, absolutely. So that is something that we keep skipping over when I, when I talk about this. That inference data set is going to have, um, it's going to have the, the data that was fed to the model to make the prediction, and it's going to have that prediction in there as well. Um, so you would need to do some work on that. It's probably more useful to do that automatic retraining if you're doing unsupervised learning, so anomaly detection and stuff like that. Um, that would probably give you a better result. Otherwise, you're going to have to deal with those labels yourself. So that, that feature of data labeling that I had, um, uh, let me just see the right slide. There we go. Um, this one here, uh, that data labeling thing, that I think that allows you to do a bit more efficient labeling of your data. Um, but yes, definitely, that inference data set is not gonna magically contain the correct answers. It's gonna contain your predictions. Um, you're gonna have to work with that to, to give you new models, um, if that's what's in there. So yes, it absolutely would cause a feedback loop and is not gonna give you um, a better result probably. Uh, new to GitHub Actions, some examples, example pipelines with GitHub Actions to learn or hands-on training or tutorials. Uh, there's a couple, and Richard, you've probably got a few of these as well. The ones I've seen, I think it's labs.github.com. Is that one? Or lab, maybe? Oh, I hope this is accessible to everyone. That's always really embarrassing. So lab.github.com is a really good one. Um, First course for actions, you know, GitHub Actions, Hello World. Uh, so yeah, lab.github.com is a really good one. Uh, for, what was the other thing you mentioned? Um, yeah, so new to GitHub Actions, lab.githubactions.com. If you're using Azure as well, um, uh, Azure Actions, so there's a, yep, there you go. So. All of the actions that, that deploy to Azure are in, um, are in GitHub, like we, they're open source. Uh, what you can do as well is have a look down here, there's a link to the Azure starter templates. And if you click on that, there's a whole bunch of these example full workflows for you know, communicating with Azure pipelines, deploying databases, let's say like a function app, um, and it will show you for example, here's an example YAML for deploying a .NET um, Azure function to a Windows you know, Azure function endpoint. Um, you know, all of the links sort of walk you through them. That's your, your YAML. So if you're doing stuff with Azure, um, that's here. And I imagine a lot of the other ones would be in the GitHub labs um, or, or places like that too. Yeah, the GitHub... Um, lab thing i only learned about that the other day actually um which is a bit of an oversight probably but uh yeah that one's pretty good it actually walks you through um i think from memory it builds a, a repo for you and then when you complete tasks it um it gives you the next step in that task as well so yeah quite cool yeah that's a new one on me too i must say i've never seen that yeah, that's awesome go. thank you <laughs> no worries um Cool. Are there any other questions? If you did have more specific questions about how the um, Azure machine learning stuff works, um, I would highly recommend watching that um, that video from the the um, Microsoft Ignite the tour because then I actually show the pipeline itself and the the code that's used for it and use Azure machine learning and things like that. I just didn't really think I'd have time to go into that level of depth. So um, yeah, that's that first link. Um, actually, there it is, machine learning operations. So yeah, applying mm -hmm. DevOps to data science. That's the, that's the first link. Well, thank you very, very much, Damien. That, that's been, mm -hmm. that was awesome. Um, well, and everyone else, thank you very, very much for taking the time out to have a bit of a listen. Um, next month's meeting at this point tentatively um, is uh, Todd Whitehead. Now, the last time we had him on, he did some real funky stuff with an Amiga. And apparently he's got something even funkier planned. So fingers crossed we can make that work for next time. Um, as usual, folks, um, if you have any feedback, please leave it on the meetup uh, uh, site.
Um, we're always happy to hear feedback. Um, if you're interested to hear of anything, tell tell me what you want or tell us what you want to hear about and we'll see if we can go find someone to help do it. Um, using Zoom and remote now, I think, really opens things up to us to be able to have more diverse and more um, topics from different people around the place. So I think it's really, really good. So on that note, folks, uh, thanks for coming and hopefully see you next time. Thank you, Damien. Thanks, everybody. Okay. See you. Bye.